one way of looking at general conference is this is what you get when you try to have a church where the median age is 61 years old. The kingdom of God is not limited to one generation, particularly to the older generation. And so I think y'all are going to have to do more kind of stepping up to say, okay, we've done it your way. Thank you, everybody over 50. But now we're going to have to ask, how is God reaching a new generation? And how can we hitch on to that? Hello, and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Eric Tchaikovsky. I'm one of the worship directors here at First United Methodist Church Richardson. And with me this week, we have two of our associate pastors, Julie Henson and Josh Fitzpatrick. Welcome to the podcast, folks. Hey, how's it going? That's good. How are you? We're good. It's May, you guys. It is May. It's going to be May. That's right. Come on now. Yeah. yeah. There's some special birthdays coming up in May, aren't there, Eric? Uh, Well, one potentially. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yours. Oh, was it mine? It was yours. See, uh, aren't I a good friend for remembering that? You actually are. I was thinking of someone else's, honestly. 64 but. years old, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. The ripe young age of 64. <laughs> yeah. Good. Happy yeah. birthday. Uh, it's Pilates. What day it's is my it? my secret before you ask. Uh, the third. On Friday. For real? Yeah. That's Megan's birthday. Stop. That is my wife's birthday. Are you sure? Wait a second. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, the third. It. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. He just checked his phone to make sure. No, I didn't. <laughs> is she 64 as well? Uh, a lot younger. Okay. Yes. Okay. I see. Sorry. I see. Well, that's okay. Well, we have a great conversation today with Bishop Will Williman. Bishop Williman has written several books and has done a lot of really great work in the United Methodist Church. When I was in seminary, we read a book called Resident Aliens that he co-authored, and it was so important and impactful in my life. And so this is a great conversation today, and we are so excited to talk to Bishop Williman. Today's guest is Dr. Will Willimon, who is a pastor, professor, retired bishop in the United Methodist Church. If you look him up on the internet, you will see article after article claiming that he is one of the best preachers in America. Dr. Willimon, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Well, it's great to be here. We'd like to just dive right in this morning. You've written a ton of books that have been read very broadly. One of your more recent books is called Who Lynched Willie Earl? Preaching to Confront Racism. Would you mind telling us a little bit about the backstory of this book and what motivated you to write it in the first place? Well, I began the book with a, a kind of narrative. When I was one year old, a lynching occurred in my hometown. South Carolina's first lynching in a number of years. That was 1947. And a trial was held a few months later that attracted international attention. This was right at the end of World War II, and South Carolina generally was very embarrassed about this event and all, and there was a big trial held and great media attention in Greenville. Interestingly enough, I spent 18 years growing up in Greenville. Nobody ever mentioned it to me. Hmm. It was totally... Repressed, And when I was in college, a history professor casually mentioned this event to me. And it was a double tragedy because not only was there a brutal, horrible removing a, a young man from jail, his name was Willie Earl, removing him from a jail in Pickens, South Carolina, taking him out and torturing him to death. But then a few months later, there was a trial held. And even though the FBI had obtained confessions, from like 23 of the 24 lynchers, they were all exonerated. Wow. There was no conviction. And the governor of South Carolina bragged, at least we had a trial. Well, anyway, none of this was mentioned to me. So therefore, in college, I heard about it and began a, a kind of lifetime interest in it. Went to the Greenville Library, and I said, I'm doing research on the Willie Earl trial. And the librarian said, uh, why? <laughs> and I said, well, because I'm curious, I'm a college student. That's what we do. And got the file and 
the thing that came to my attention was there was a young Methodist preacher in the little town of Pickens where the lynching had actually occurred named Holly Lynn. And Holly Lynn had just graduated from Yale Divinity School, went to this Grace Methodist Church in Pekin, South Carolina. His wife had died a couple of months earlier giving childbirth to his daughter. And when Holly Lynn heard about this lynching, he immediately started work on a sermon. And the title of the sermon was called, Who Lynched Willie Earl? And that sermon was later published in the South Carolina Methodist Advocate. And I judged it to be the most important sermon preached in South Carolina Methodism (laughs) in their history. So the story got wider and deeper and became the story of this Methodist preacher who spoke out. And by the way, in all our research, we could only find one pastor, a Baptist pastor in Sparkburg, South Carolina. We could only find one other pastor who dared to speak out against this lynching. Mm -hmm. Holly Lynn did. And so my book, was not only about the lynching and the trial, briefly, but in more detail about Holly Lynn's courageous sermon. And taking this as an example of United Methodist preachers at our best, taking Holly Lynn as an exemplar of the need to speak up and speak out in Jesus' name. And so that was what the rest of the book was about. So you obviously feel that the church and preachers have a responsibility to speak into issues like this, into conversations like this. There's also a huge movement as the country becomes more diverse and our communities become more diverse for our churches to be more representative of what our communities look like. So in your experience as both a pastor and a bishop, have you seen churches that wanted to become more racially diverse, do that successfully and reflect their community more successfully? And if so, what were some of the steps that led to that goal? Yeah, you know, I think in the book I presented first the need to preach on race, to preach about racism as a sin, as maybe with my friend Jim Wallace, America's original sin, that great, dark, public secret that helps explain our culture, our country, our laws, our economy, our education, a lot, and the church. But I wanted to think about it as Christians. You can think about race from a variety of perspectives, but how do we think as Christians about it? And early on, I had to admit, race, the designation of human beings on the basis of physical characteristics labeling them as members of a certain race, that's not a biblical idea and is found nowhere in Scripture. It's an invention of the European Enlightenment. So to think about race like Christians requires some analogous thinking. And I hit on principally on Paul's uh, work on Jews and Gentiles in the early church, as we find it in Paul's letters. I talk a lot about confession. Uh, What do Christians do with sin? Well, we confess it. We're not surprised by it. We are fallen creatures. And how is racism fit in that? And then I also talk about forgiveness, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And one of the sins that we're saved from, being saved from, I talk about confession as a process. Only later did I talk about diversity in congregations I mean, one challenge of diversity so often in my church is it's an all-white congregation saying, we want to be more welcome to you. Now, why don't you come join us? Mm -hmm. That doesn't get you very far with African Americans. I mean, they're right to see that we're still holding the power to welcome and invite. I did get into some of the literature, though, on inclusiveness and diversity in the church I hate to be a spoiler, but as I read the literature, it sort of shows that is very, very difficult truly to achieve. In fact, it is very rare. In fact, I read a great book by a woman. It was entitled something like The Myth of the Racially Inclusive Congregation, showing that mainline Protestantism, a racially diverse congregation, 
is so rare as to be insignificant numerically. You do get inclusion in Pentecostal congregations, in free church congregations, which causes me as a mainline Protestant some pain. But even in those congregations, many times these congregations brag, oh, we're about 30% African American, 5% Asian American, the rest Caucasian, and we never talk about race. And we never, mm-hmm. we just don't mention it, but look, but look what God's done among us. Well, sometimes that means that we're frightened to talk about this issue because we're frightened it might destroy the modicum of racial diversity we've achieved. In my book, I say, you know, you need to deal with race where you are. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And if you're talking to an all-white congregation, that's got to be a different discussion than if you're talking to a predominantly African-American congregation. Yeah, I think that you've made such a good point in that we have to actually talk about it. That's just a, maybe arguably a sin of the church even, that we don't address racism and we don't address the ways in which even our systems and our own power differentials play into that. And so even before we can get to being a radically diverse or a racially diverse church, to even talk about the racism that exists, I think, is so important. Mm-hmm. And I think it could be even a distinctive place in the church, a place that makes the church distinct from other places in society or in communities. So you wrote a book with Stanley Auerwas that I read in seminary and has uh, continued to be one of my very favorite books called Resident Aliens, Life in the Christian Colony. And in it, you advocate for the distinct role that the church plays in the world. So for those of our listeners who may be less familiar with that idea, why does the church need to be distinct? Well, I'd say we need to be distinct because of Jesus Christ. Mm. Jesus Christ is a very distinctive, controversial, counterintuitive, countercultural definition of who God is and what God is up to in the world. Jesus Christ is the distinctive God we didn't expect. Mm. In fact, as you see from the cross, uh, not the God we wanted. We have multiple competing means of salvation in the world. Materialism and militarism, you know, ways of securing our lives, protecting ourselves, making our lives have meaning. Jesus Christ is uh, counter (laughs) to most of the popular ways of getting saved, if you want to use that language. And therefore, the people he gathers are going to look odd. They're going to be distinctive. So therefore, I think the church is compelled to be distinctive simply because Jesus is. To stand up in the most violent nation in the world, if you just add up the body count from Americans killing Americans, you know, to stand up in that kind of culture and say, no more of this, or to say, God's way is nonviolent, do not take retribution into your own hands. To make comments like that, you're going to end up with an odd-looking group of people. Mm. And I've said in the recent United Methodist Agonies after our special general conference, which turned out not to be special at all, I've Mm. said to some of my traditionalist buddies who voted to seal the church down against same-sex unions and LBGTQ clergy, I've said to them, okay, what are you going to do about the Trinity now? Because the Trinity, I have found through years of experience working with God, the Trinity, for some reason, not only the Trinity, loves to produce LBGTQ people. I'm weakly surprised by someone who shows up and is LBGTQ. I don't think General Conference can stop God from doing that. So you're going to have a problem. And I think that keeps the church being weird, (laughs) keeps Hmm. the church being different from the United States of America. And the reason isn't this that we enjoy being different because no Methodist enjoys being different, which was one of the criticisms of that book was, I can't believe two Methodists wrote this book about being distinctive. And we said, well, probably because... Lack of distinctiveness is is one of our Methodist faults. Hmm. 
So in speaking about General Conference specifically, that gathering, you've written a little bit about why you feel like the General Conference in the United Methodist denomination is no longer a viable vehicle for decision making. Do you feel like it used to be viable or has something changed? And and if so, what have we lost along the way? I hear General Conference used to be valuable and viable. (laughs) I'm only 72 years old, so I never knew such a time. But Mm. I hear that from historians and all. One thing I think is important, though, to note is General Conference, what we witnessed in St. Louis and all, that's a new invention in the history of the church. I judge it to be about 55, 60 years old. Beginning in the 1960s, we started transforming General Conference into a large, far-flung representative body that was to produce legislation for the church. That's what General Conference became. It's a meeting preceded by one week of committee meetings whose job is to produce more laws and rules for the church. And then you have a second week where we debate all those laws and rules and add them to the discipline. The United Methodist Book of Discipline, and by the way, it used to be called the Book of Discipline and Doctrine of the Methodist Mm -hmm. Church, that book has grown by 30% since the 60s. So... If God is dismantling that process, I don't know that's a bad thing. I think we're probably being judged. To me, this last general conference was sort of public, obvious judgment that that way of leading and governing the church by this huge 800-plus people assembly speaking seven different languages, that just is not viable. That's not the way Christians decide things. So, Dr. Willimon, I'm curious, within the system itself, you have the role of the bishop. In 2016, the bishops were asked to take a lead on the issue of LGBT inclusion in our churches, and it seems like they held this special session, and they took that step of leadership, at least in putting forth some proposals. I'm really curious, from your inside perspective, on what you see the role of the bishop in our system being, what it has been, and maybe how that role has changed specifically? Well, it's changed dramatically in our system, principally because of General Conference. I was sad that General Conference basically said at the last General Conference, wow, we can't fix this. We can't come to a decision about this. So therefore, the bishops have got to help us. The bishops have got to decide this. Now, Remember, these are the same bishops that have no voice and no vote at general conference. Right. Every general conference that's had any opportunity to take power and authority from the bishops has done that. I've asked bishops who worry about these things, can you think of one single time in the last 40 years general conference has empowered the bishops in some way They can't think of a thing. Well, then you turn to the bishops. Well, so the bishops got together, and our bright idea was we need to have a special general conference. Since the last 10 general conferences can't solve this, we need to have a special general (laughs) conference in two years that does nothing but try to fix this, you know. And then we had a finding the way forward and all that, and it it was just kind of sad. And basically, after the first votes were taken at the special general conference, One of the bishops said to me, I didn't know how much the church disliked us (laughs) or ignored us till these votes. So my heart goes out to the bishops. They're being told, you bishops need to step up and lead. Come on, be strong, lead. When general conferences made every effort to keep us from leading. On the other hand, maybe the church through this fiasco we'll get back to the sense that bishops can lead, but they got to lead the same way pastors lead. I always said as a pastor, Jesus did not allow me to have a bullwhip or an army backing me up, even though I really had some people that I wanted to punish. (laughs) You know, all Jesus gave me was talk, words to persuade people, to cajole people, to beg people, to threaten people. And I kind of think, Bishop's power is the same kind of power, and that means it's it's limited power, but it's also, I'm free, perfectly free, 
to talk people into being more faithful disciples. And so therefore, when I talk, I need to pray, Lord, give me some words here. You said you would do it. Mm. Give me some words to minister here, to lead here. So in that sense, bishops have a lot of power. And I must say, after this general conference, I, Monday, spent some time downloading sermons from some of my former students just to see what they talked about on Sunday. It was a deeply moving experience Mm -hmm. to watch these pastors stand up in front of people who knew them, and they knew the people. They were the pastor. They had been authorized to speak by those people. And they stood up and in various ways said things like, okay, people, we've had a general conference. Nothing, nothing that happened at general conference has any relevance to this congregation. It does have relevance to clergy issues, but probably we shouldn't have spent so much time as a church worrying about clergy issues anyway. It has some relevance about dissident congregations threatening to leave, and it has no relevance to us. It cannot limit anything we're doing for Jesus. Now, stay focused, people. Come on. Here's the Lord's table. There's the body and blood of Jesus at the table. Stay focused. Okay, now, we're ready. Let's go. So that was the one good that came out of General Conference is noting ultimately in God's scheme of things how irrelevant General Conference is. And the people interviewing me for the New York Times and all, they don't know the irrelevancy of General Conference. I mean, they're acting like it's Mm -hmm. a big news story. The big news story for Christians is whatever Jesus does with people, real people back in real context in that congregation. So in light of that and in light of us getting focused in our churches, where do you see our denomination moving forward in the next few years? I think the best we can hope for for the denomination is to muddle through. Just keep talking, keep arguing. Please don't vote on anything. Just keep (laughs) arguing and talking. Stay with us. See how many people you can worship Jesus with. Be surprised at who Jesus Christ calls to be his church. Enjoy that. See the adventure in that. You know, maybe I know uh, my buddies, uh, Adam Hamilton, Mike Slaughter, Matt Miofsky, they're talking about a big gathering to talk about what next. Maybe that's the way forward is to say, we've tried annual conferences, sending delegations and all that don't work. And maybe we're going to wake up one day and be having these great gatherings at the Church of the Resurrection or somewhere and say, oh, did they have general conference this year? Oh, I didn't, I missed that. I didn't know that. (laughs) Or maybe some annual conference will say, I'm sorry, we are so engaged in mission. We don't have time to spend two days voting on delegates to a meeting that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. There won't be a delegation from Alabama this general conference. Okay, y'all have a good time. But our people are just too busy to waste that much time. So we have a redemptive God who loves to redeem our screw-ups. And that's our hope. And I think it's going to be fun to watch what Jesus is going to do. So, Dr. Wilmon, you obviously have a lot of passion around this issue, around the conversation of racism, which we've talked a bit about. I'm sure in the multitude of books that you've written that this passion just comes out in your writing. Your books have sold more than one million copies. How does it make you feel when you think about the impact that you've had on so many people who have read your books? Well, it's humbling. I mean, for Julie to say, hey, I read this book and For me, it's similar to the thrill of of somebody coming out of church and saying to me, wow, that's the best sermon you ever preached. God really spoke to me today. I'm going to sell the pickup truck, learn Spanish, move to Honduras as a missionary. Or even when somebody comes out and says, that was the worst thing I have ever heard. I am reporting you to your superiors. (laughs) That's just awful. I mean, even that in the weird consciousness of preachers, you know, said, "Mm, not bad. Somebody's (laughs) listening. Yeah, great. Uh, At least they didn't react to me like they reacted to Jesus. Mm. Uh, This may seem dishonest, but I I look upon my writing as just extension of my preaching, and I react to people's Mm. reactions 
like I do about my preaching. And I cannot believe God chose me to be the one talking about this. And I've done something that I swore I'd never do. Make a note. Don't swear to God stuff you'll never do. (laughs) I've written a memoir. And the title of my memoir is called Accidental Preacher. I think this is the first place I've mentioned this, so I'm going public. All right. And All right. in my memoir, I'm kind of saying the only really interesting thing that ever happened to me was that God chose me to be a preacher. And it is a great life if that's what God wants you to do. I got to write some books, but I got to preach a lot more sermons. And preaching is just inextricably connected to the Christian faith somebody's got to stand up and tell the story. Somebody's got to say the word. You can't come up with Jesus by having long walks in the woods. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to tell it to you, and you've got to receive it with open hands. And that dynamic will be enacted in your church next Sunday, and it's a mysterious holy moment. And I got to be part of that, and I thank God. Mm. So for those of us who are in the pulpit on a regular basis— Do you have some keys to preaching great sermons? I think a great path to a good sermon is to be with your people. Just going about your pastoral duties, you get good stuff laid on you. That's why I say nobody but pastors should be preachers, even though I do it nearly every Sunday. I'm visiting somewhere and I'm not their pastor. But I think pastoral work, puts you in the proper context for the interpretation of Scripture. These pastors who've actually sat across from some brother or sister in horrible pain, people maybe who've prayed to God for 10 years, please change my sexual orientation. But it's not a matter of being soft on Scripture or being too liberal It's a matter that when you're a pastor, you get your nose rubbed into real human beings struggling to follow Jesus. And forgive us if we have great empathy with them in that task. Well, Dr. Willimon, I appreciate your insight. I love that idea that if you're going to be a preacher proclaiming judgment, it needs to start with you as the preacher first. Mm -hmm. I think that's just solid. And and are you moving now to asking me, uh, hey, what do you confess to God when you confess all of you? <laughs> I mean, is, is, that yes. where, is that where this is going? That, that's yeah. where this is leading. Ready, go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well, you know, let me ask you guys, what's the median age of the people who are interviewing me right now? I'm just curious. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, 33? Yeah, probably 33. Okay, good. How old is Julie? I'm 30. Okay. My mother told me you're never supposed to ask that. Anyway, uh, (laughs) but my mother told me a lot of stuff. uh, But uh, that you said you wouldn't do, but you did it anyway. Yeah, I did, and yeah, (laughs) and confession time. So you're a minority in the United Methodist Church. You know, I was a college chaplain for 20 years, and so I tend to explain a lot of stuff as generational differences because just Mm. daily I was impressed talking to students. You're not living in the same world I'm living in. You don't see the same stuff I see when I look out the window and all. Well, I really think for those of you 33 and under, one way of looking at general conference is this is what you get when you try to have a church where the median age is 61 years old. Mm. There is no biblical justification for calling that a church. The kingdom of God is not limited to one generation, particularly to the older generation. And so I think if y'all ever wonder during the day, you know, why has God called me to be a pastor and all that, I really believe you're getting your answer to that question. And that is that God has called you for such a time as this. And I just think y'all are going to have to do more kind of stepping up to say, okay, we've done it your way. Thank you everybody over 50. But now we're going to have to ask, how is God reaching a new generation? And how can we hitch on to that? And can you let us lead? And I used to appoint 20-something clergy to older churches in Alabama. And I'd say to them, you're getting a wonderful young woman. She's very well qualified. I followed her through seminary. 
star student. By the way, according to my numbers, this is your last chance at a future. Mm. And I want all of you to let her guide you. Put yourselves in her hands. Ask her about her ideas. She's full of ideas. A lot of them are going to push you, but you're working for her as she tries to give you a future. By the way, it might not work because it's not working in most of our churches, but who knows? Holy Spirit might say, wow, you got a new preacher who's under 50. This is your time. So blessings on you in that. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. So... Dr. Willimon, we have one more question that we ask every one of our guests, and that is this. Up to this point in your life, what is one thing that you wish someone would have told you? Oh, wow. I guess I wish, let me just put it this way. I wish I'd been told more frequently that Jesus Christ is Lord and that every person I deal with all day long, particularly the people who I don't like the most and disagree with the most and all. He is their Lord. You know, I I guess wish I'd had somebody every day, you know, when I jump out of bed to say, okay, Jesus Christ is Lord. You're going to be shocked by the people for whom he died. Now get out there and get on board with it. I think my life would have been even more adventuresome. Hmm. Hmm. Dr. Wilmon, at the beginning of our conversation when we were making introductions off the air, you asked us to call you Will, and we did a really poor job of that just out of our respect for you and for the work (laughs) that you've done. But I'll say at the very end of our interview, Will, thank you very much for your time. Thank Thank you you. for sharing your your words and your thoughts with us today. You know, if I may just critique your generation for just a moment. Uh, I'm listening. Okay, and and I know you hate this, but— Sometimes your generation, to me, is too deferential. I mean, I was from the 60s, and we said to our elders, get out of the way. Let us be in charge. Well, okay, we've been in charge, and we produced a special general conference. And I'm wanting your generation to step up and be less respectful of what we produced and to say, hey, old people, go on to the home. Let us show you the way here. And so thank you for your deferential politeness. I like that. However, I believe what Jesus is asking you to do is going to require some toughness and belligerence. So go for that, too. But thank you. You bet, Will. All right. Well, in that spirit, get out of here. Okay. We're done. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. All right. Thank you, Will. One of the things that I'm challenged by as I listen to Bishop Willimon talk is the idea that no matter how much we disagree and how much confusion there might be about the future of the denomination, it's not about us. It's all about God. And God has been faithful to not just the United Methodist Church, but to the church in general for generations. And God will remain faithful. God is sitting on the throne and God will remain faithful into the future. And so to that end, we want to leave you today with the lyrics of the famous hymn, Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of More Than Sunday. If you like the podcast, please feel free to share it, go online and leave a comment, or give us a rating so that others might hear about us. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure you also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or on Spotify so you don't miss our next episode. If you want to find out more about First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at fumcr.com, as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to Bishop Will Williman for joining us this week. And make sure you tune in next Wednesday when we have a conversation with Ramsey Patton. Have a great week.